So, uh, my name is Jonathan Williams. I'm a web developer at uh, Boston University. Um, and I'm going to talk about the WordPress. Can you hear me? Is the mic working? Is this better? How about this? Okay, so I got to be really close. So, I just want to talk about the uh, WordPress media library uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, a couple of disclaimers. This isn't a talk about anything um, that exists right now. This is a, a vision for what the WordPress Media Library could be. Um, there, I don't have any demos or, or plugins or themes. Um, it's pure science fiction. But uh, I think there's some opportunities and uh, there's some ways of working with WordPress um, that might be useful for the future. So. Just a couple of definitions. Um, WordPress, we all know WordPress, and it's blogging software, which originally how it started, and it's evolved into um, a CMS platform. Now, another thing I'm going to talk about is DAM, or uh, Digital Asset Management. Um, digital Asset Management is uh, its not really even one piece of software or um, one thing that you do. Uh, it's a whole system of tasks and, and protocols for storage and the long-time retrieval of, of digital media. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a talk about the media library and um, in my slides I don't have any pictures at all. So I'm going to try to keep it a little interesting. We'll have a little uh, audience interaction. So a show of hands, how many people here have ever used the WordPress media library? Okay, lots of people, great. Now, how many people here have ever actually used a full digital asset management system? We got a couple. So that's something like Cumulus or um, Adobe has a great big expensive thing that they sell for a lot of money. So I've got, there's a lot more people here who've used the WordPress li library than a damn system, which is pretty normal. Now. How many people here have grabbed a PDF from the, media from the WordPress media library and sent it to somebody who was looking for it? A couple of people. Um, how many people have used a picture from the media library in some other context? That's some more people. And how many people have ever thought to yourself, wow, I'm really glad that, I, that this file is in the media library. I know I have it somewhere. There's an original. Uh, but hey, great, it's in the media library. So that's a few people. So now another show of hands. Now how many of you used a digital asset management system? Maybe a few more. Um, so do we manage digital assets? All of us do all the damn time. <laughs> so my theory is that you and lots of other people have probably already been using WordPress as a kind of rudimentary digital asset management system. And the, what I'm going to kind of sketch out this evening is, is an idea of maybe WordPress can and should catch up to you. Maybe WordPress should become actually a real digital asset management system. Now, that seems far-fetched. If you've ever used any of these big complicated packages, they're big and complicated for a reason. Digital asset management is really hard and really expensive. But WordPress didn't used to be a content management system either. Remember, it started out as blogging software. And maybe turning into a full digital asset management system might be um, in its destiny. So to uh, drill down to that uh, a little further, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some, uh, this idea I'm calling archive first, uh, which is maybe a, a bit of a nebulous concept at first, but I'm trying to get at what it would be like if WordPress did all the right things to support us in this task of really long-term um, storage and retrieval of the things that we care about, which is our digital stuff. Um, and I'm going to go into uh, a couple of, of kind of finer points of what I think might happen, um, what WordPress needs, things like resolution independence, things like better collections um, and um, access control. 
So when I say archive first, what is it that, that I mean? So one thing that if you're working with um, any kind of archive that you want to last beyond just the immediate publishing, um, say Bindu, she publishes a book, she wants that book available, right, in the marketplace now. But um, for certain kinds of books, you might want that book to be around in 100 years. You want, might want people still to be able to read it. And just putting it on Amazon, maybe Amazon is going to hold on to, to it for you, maybe not. There's no way to know. Uh, so if you care about stuff like that, you, you need ways of holding on to it. And one thing that I think is important is anything that you're using for an archival system, and this is not the way most people are, 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 are kind of trained to think about digital assets, is you want to store it at the full quality always. Wherever it is that your picture or your PDF or your PowerPoint is going to wind up, where you're going to find it in the future if you need to turn it into something else, wherever it is that you put it, you should always put it at the full quality. And I, I kind of go through this with, with clients and customers a lot. People ask me, okay, so uh, I want to give you this photo for my website. W what resolution should I give it to you? And for several years now, I've only had one answer for that. What, what resolution did you shoot it at? Where did it start out? I, I, I want um, sort of people in general, but WordPress specifically, to get out of this notion that we have to downres our media before we publish it. Um, we should hand our media off to uh, a publishing system that is just going to take it as it is. And that's, if you do that, you start to get towards uh, this concept that I'm going to put it in a system that's going to hold on to it for as long as, as, as humanly possible or, or maybe serverly possible, I suppose, if we're talking about computers. Now another aspect of, of this archive first um, concept that I think is really important is um, single source. Um, this kind of comes up, uh, it actually came up recently in um, the uh, WordPress core chat about the media library. What do we do about if I want to crop, I have a picture of a lion, um, but I want to focus on this part of the line. Well, let me crop it and I'll upload the crop photo and then that'll be in the media library. And there are several problems with this from a um, digital asset management perspective. And, but the most practical one is you wind up with a whole lot of crap in your media library. And when you get all of these derivatives that are mixed in with your originals, it makes it very difficult for you and more importantly, other people that make come after you, okay, well, there's five pictures of this lion. I know they're all the same picture. Which one do I use? Or I've got so many duplicates that if I'm looking for one photo that I want, I have to wade through um, all these different duplicates, and it makes it very unwieldy. And it's something that um, the big uh, uh, kind of dam systems uh, have ways of addressing. And it's a very important problem to address. And then the other thing that I think is important um, if the WordPress media library is going to become um, your archival system as well as your publishing system, it's got to be what I call the final resting place for your media. You're not going to upload it there and then you're going to put it over here on my S3 and then over here maybe in Google and I got it on Dropbox and I have, you know, it's good to have um, lots of different copies of things, but in terms of, of being able to, you know, if, if somebody's got to come after you in particular and, and, and look at your stuff, they, it has to be all in one place. So the WordPress media library, if it's going to accord with this, this um, ambitious vision that I'm assigning to it, um, it should be the authoritative source for anything that goes in it. If it's, if it's also, if it's not just the publishing medium, it's also the archive, then everybody who needs to work with it needs to know that's where I need to go um, um, to find the thing that I'm looking for because that's where it lives. And for uh, some of the people that I work with, particularly in academia, uh, particularly research groups, I find it often helpful to imagine the end user, not just the person who's browsing the website today, 
I try to think of a librarian 100 years from now thinking, how do I catalog this stuff for people today or in the future uh, to look at? It's not necessarily the case that everything you're doing is so interesting that 100 years from now, people are going to be like, wow, that's so great that they did that. But if you can address that scenario, then I think it, it goes a long way towards really uh, kind of thinking through the kind of persistence that we'd like to have um, in, our, in our archives. Um, and it's not just do the bits exist somewhere on disk, which is an important question, but it's also can someone find them? And then I, I think it's, it bears uh, uh, kind of repeating that, that once you once you have this idea um, that you're going to store everything in this place, it's going to be the final resting place, everything is going to be uh, full resolution, then you really work from a place that anything that actually makes it into that uh, media library should be precious. Everybody who works with it should be very concerned uh, with holding on to it uh, for the long term. And one thing that I think about um, with websites and, and kind of persistence uh, just culturally, it's becoming more and more important to us because it used to be if you wanted to write something down and keep it for 100 years, you just publish a book, put it in a library, it's going to sit there, it's going to be there in the future. More and more, a lot of the really culturally relevant things that we do, they don't get written down in books. Online is the only place that it exists. And if it disappears from the online space, it disappears forever. Um, and when you're talking about running ar archives, that's the, that's the thing you're trying to avoid. Things shouldn't disappear forever. So then um, just a little more detail about, about this idea um, in, in terms of, of, of practically managing things. Um, if, it's, if it's really an archive, it should have a certain kind of permeability. Other systems should be able to reach into it and pull things out. And that's things like API access, um, and it, it's, you know, right now with, with WordPress specifically, if you want to know that a certain asset is embedded in a web page, really the only way to find out is to scan through the markup and see if you see an image tag, right? And that's a very loose coupling um, that makes things uh, 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 fragile and brittle uh, in a way that's, that's unhelpful uh, if, you, if you're talking about trying to make things easy to find in the future. So that's kind of the rough concept of, of this, what if uh, the media library were kind of optimized for archiving in, in addition to publishing. So to go into a little more detail, um, resolution independence. Like why is resolution independence important? And I feel like uploading the asset to the media library, that should be the hard part. If you got your PDF, your picture, whatever it is you care about, if you got it all the way up to the server, you shouldn't have to think about it much more beyond that. That should be the hard part. What resolution should it be displayed at? WordPress knows. It has the markup. It has all the theme information. WordPress should be able to scale it for you. It knows the size. It's either got Image Magic or uh, uh, GD, the other uh, uh, graphics package. So, it already ought to be able to, to handle it for us. And, um, and that also kind of goes beyond just resolution. I mentioned cropping before. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really practical step to get away from um, that fragility of having lots and lots of different versions of the same thing. Uh, and it, it really, once WordPress knows what size things should be, uh, and has some intelligence about it, then um, you get to have a, a tighter coupling uh, between the <laughs> asset as it exists in the media library and where it appears, all the other places that it's in your, in your website. So then I wanted to mention um, this idea of collections, uh, which is a very uh, kind of powerful uh, concept often in, when you're talking about things like Cumulus and the other large scale um, asset management systems because things like Cumulus, you might be a Fortune 500 company and you might have literally a million pictures that you're tracking. Uh, and you don't want to have to wade through every single picture. You need to 
work with them in collections. And the first uh, example of that that I think is really important, obviously, for WordPress is things like image galleries, which we can do now. They exist, but I feel are, are a little kind of ad hoc because WordPress isn't really good, you know, typing in a short code and saying, well, picture five, seven, 963 and 247, they're all in my image gallery. I can't really search for that. I can't say, show me all the slideshows that have the lion picture in them, right? It's, it's, it's not a strong enough way of, of, of expressing how assets are related to each other. Um, and image galleries, I think, is kind of a, a, um, the, the easiest to explain because everybody needs image galleries, right? But it's a powerful concept that applies also to document sets, and other just kind of semantic relationships. Uh, an example um, that, that I work with sometimes with, with research groups is they'll have a project, right? And then they'll write papers about the project. And they might write six, seven papers that go into journals, right? Those papers, the PDFs, they're related. Um, and they're not just related to each other, they're related to this other post that's kind of the central hub for that project. Um, WordPress doesn't really have the best way of expressing those relationships right now. You have taxonomies, and if you're clever and you install some plugins and you leverage some stuff that's in core that isn't really exposed anywhere, um, you can assign taxonomies to images, which is a start. Um, but it's not really codified. It's, it's still kind of this, this hidden feature in a way. Um, and it, it, it doesn't really, it's, it's still you're using tax, the taxonomy system that's designed for posts. It doesn't have a way of expressing, well, if you're going to show one of these pictures, you should invoke some JavaScript and build an image gallery and help people browse through them. So the, this concept of collections is really about um, relationships. Um, and the relationships need to be explicit at the system level. Just scanning through markup and being able to see, oh, I find this image tag here, um, you know, that's certainly something that you can do, but I think for this, this archiving idea, um, it's, it's, it's not explicit enough. Uh, and a powerful concept that I found out about when I first started talking to librarians about these kind of things, it turns out librarians have this concept called finding aids. I'd never heard of it before, but it turns out it's the primary way that a librarian, particularly now that librarians are actually starting to grapple with digital media, um, you have a collection of stuff. Some student is interested in that topic and says, I hear the library has a collection of detailed bio biological renderings of frogs, right? Or some kind of research archive. You need something that's gonna help the librarian actually point the researcher to the thing that they're looking for. So finding it is any kind of metadata that you have about an asset or a thing that's part of your collection that helps somebody who cares about it find it. Um, and those kinds of, 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 of finding aids are often expressed through these kinds of relationships. Not just what is the thing, but what else is it related to. So then another thing I want to touch on um, uh, briefly, because it, it, it came up when I rehearsed this talk, is uh, access control. And access control is something that um, actually WordPress is, is kind of bad at because it's a publishing system first. And there are ways that you can protect things and put passwords on things. But um, one of the ways that the WordPress, whatever access control you're using, can break down is that the page itself might have some access control on it. But the images or uh, um, uh, uh, PDFs that might be linked from it, they don't know what the publishing status of the containing page is. Uh, and this can be uh, a really big deal for, uh, um, again, to use the example of, of researchers. Researchers, if they want a patent, you can only patent something that hasn't been disclosed to the general public yet, right? So there, I've, I've talked to people who were really working very hard for years sometimes on a patent and somebody accidentally posted something to a website 
And that counted as disclosure. And now they can't get a patent anymore, which is very upsetting um, situation if you're a researcher. So there are certain kinds of, of things that you may want to publish, and they're going to be public, but they're not public yet. If you can't put it in your archive until it's public, then it's not really your archive, right? Because it can't be your final resting place. Once it's done, you need to put it where it lives. And if you can't put it there because you don't have access controls yet, it really throws a whole monkey wrench um, into the whole model. So that's kind of a brief introduction into some of the, uh, the challenges of, of working with a really, um, a really rich and complete digital media archive. Um, so what I'm uh, trying to get to is that there, there might be avenues for uh, incremental change. WordPress doesn't do all of this stuff right now, and it's not going to do all of this stuff tomorrow. Um, but any of these things that if we could add these features into WordPress in isolation, they would still be beneficial. I think resolution independence on its own would be a handy thing that we, people would start using and would get us on um, a road towards a real digital asset management system uh, coming out of WordPress. And it seems impossible, I think, if you know a lot <laughs> about these kinds of systems, but then honestly, so does Gutenberg. I don't know if uh, people are very familiar with uh, Gutenberg, which is the new um, editor for uh, uh, posts and pages uh, that's upcoming in WordPress. And it's, it's controversial. It's, it's a radically new thing. Um, but it would really um, reinvent, I think, in a lot of ways, the WordPress experience. Um, and Gutenberg honestly seems impossible right now because it's such a radical change. Uh, but it's really likely uh, to happen anyway. Impossible, though it may seem. So in conclusion, I just want to say, the media, less, the, the media library is pretty good. I'm not, I'm not anti-media uh, library here. Uh, but I feel like there's a, a power back, vacuum in media management. As I mentioned before, it, digital media is how we're storing knowledge now. Um, and I think nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, the, the, the digital asset management systems, I think, are too expensive and too complex. And they're not really given, you know, by the show of hands, they're not really things that normal people use now, and they're not likely to become things that normal people use in the future. Um, so to the world domination part, which was in the first slide, we didn't really get to it, but here it is. I think with, with these kinds of improvements, the, uh, the WordPress Media Library really could become a de facto standard for digital archiving. I think of all the WordPress libraries that already exist in the world um, and all of the assets that people do care a lot about that are already actually in a WordPress Media Library. If WordPress could catch up to them, it could really be a powerful thing for things that, are people do, that people are already doing, and in the future, um, it could really grow to uh, occupy a space in, in publishing that, where I think it's needed. And that's my presentation. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Yes? If nature abhors a vacuum, how come this hasn't already happened? That's an excellent question. Um, and Honestly, I would argue the reason why it hasn't happened is because people like me who are kind of geeky about this stuff haven't agitated for it, right? There's not a lot of people who are thinking about that librarian 100 years in the future. That's not a common thing. I'm perfectly comfortable with it because that's how I've been working for years, but I understand that that's not, that's not how people are, are conditioned to think about this stuff. So that's why I didn't have any plugins or, 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 or demos, because I don't think we're kind of at this point. I think that it would take a shift in people's thinking away from, oh, I have this thing and I need to, I need to publish it, so I'm going to put it on WordPress. A shift in thinking towards, I have this thing that I care about, it's going to live in WordPress, and I'm going to publish it from there. Does that make sense?
Is that a really good question, though? Maybe just to add a follow-up to that, the other reason why a lot of media improvements around WordPress tend to feel kind of slow is that actually the code of the media library, despite being very advanced in what it does, is something that's understood only by a very small group of people. So if you're interested in improving the media library and want to help be a part of the work to improve what we provide it for and make the foundation for building this type of system better, um, I would encourage you to um, come to Contributor Days at WordCamps or to get in touch with some of the people in the local community who contribute to WordPress for We can see whether we can make it better. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to try to follow that excellent advice. And uh, if anybody's already on the, uh, the WordPress core Slack channel, I, I recommend dropping by the, uh, the core media channel. Everybody's very friendly there, uh, and I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's a tough question because I think in part we're, we're only at the dawn of the printed page not being the archive source anymore. I feel like that transition happened um, and it happened very decisively it, because we're, it's not just words anymore. Like a lot of things that used to, you would have to write it down are now on video, okay? And you would have to, even when we had video, you'd have to broadcast it. And unless you had sophisticated recording equipment, it's gone forever. But now it's easy to make a video. It's easy to publish a video. Um, and that video may be the thing that, that contains what anybody would ever want to know about it, and it's not going to get written down. Uh, I think part of the, part of the challenge is um, the culture hasn't caught up to that yet. People aren't thinking about, um, and I, not to go on too, too long, but this is a really interesting question to me. I think about the Library of Alexandria. That's kind of what I think about in terms of losing critical human knowledge. There was a library in Alexandria, Egypt, about 300 AD. It was where most of the books in the world were kept, and it burned down, and we lost all that stuff. There's all kinds of human knowledge that we used to know that we didn't. Um, and the internet's not very secure. Computers aren't very good at listening to the people they're supposed to be listening to. All kinds of people can hijack all kinds of networks and tell them to do something bad. So I worry about a Library of Alexandria event happening on the, on the modern internet, honestly. Is that a, is that a good answer? Yeah. 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 It's it's it. I I I I feel that point uh, intensely, and I, I feel kind of I feel uh, sorry for and frustrated with all the people that I see who aren't worried about that. Um, right. And and. An excellent point. And when I've talked about this, uh, um, uh, this kind of archive first idea, uh, one of the uh, uh, one piece of feedback that I got was very interesting. Was like, well, how do you back that up? If everything is full resolution in your, in your media library, how do you back up your media library? It's going to get unwieldy and large. Um, and I do think that um, 
Uh, I went to an AWS training once, and the trainer said, um, friends don't friend, let friends build data centers, uh, which really kind of summed up the whole cloud thing that I hadn't gotten until I, I, I heard that. I think that um, we are going to have to rely on other people to build these data centers um, that are going to store all our stuff for us, but we can't necessarily rely on them not to screw any of it up. So um, I think that uh, things like Amazon S3 are, are very, very good and has a whole information life cycle behind it if you use it correctly. Um, if you don't use it correctly, then you can lose it just as easily as if you dropped your hard drive in the bathtub, honestly. Um, so I think part of it is uh, the cloud is important um, and it's a big piece of kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, because you can't treat WordPress as your thing that stores everything unless you have some storage mechanism that's reliable and consistent that can actually just take everything. Um, so I think there's, a, there's an interesting uh, WordPress plugin called uh, Tachyon that actually it's a, it's a rescaling image server um, that uses S3 natively as, as, as its primary storage. So I think that we'll probably be moving things like this, but I, I think just relying on one provider is probably not the answer. You want to replicate your, uh, your archive on Amazon S3, on Google Cloud Compute, on Backblaze, on, you know, you probably want to have kind of strategy and depth and multiple providers, because the cloud is actually something that rains on you. <laughs> That's how I think about the cloud if you don't do it right. Yes? Yeah, it's a great idea, and I have talked to librarians about it. Um, the issue that I found kind of a stumbling block is librarians actually have all these protocols. Um, they have extremely sophisticated protocols. Um, things like Dublin Core that none of us are, have heard of. Well, some of us have, have heard. Anybody heard of Dublin Core? Okay. Two people. Awesome. <laughs> Three. But that's not a lot of people. Dublin Core is not easy to implement. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I've had some fascinating meetings with some brilliant librarians and I'm like, great, let's find a way to put all your stuff in, 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 in your systems, in your library systems. But the, the library systems for doing this, they started out in the 90s because librarians have extremely long time frames and they don't know how to implement it all yet. They're, the libraries are working with software that in a way is kind of even more complicated than the commercial digital asset management systems. So I think librarians have a really uh, strong role to play and they really should have a seat at the table. I feel like um, some of these decisions, we should have actually more librarians involved directly. Uh, but right now, they don't have an easy way. It's not like there's a plugin for WordPress that says make my media library something a librarian would be into. But I think we need something like that. And then my other point is, I was glad you brought up about the disclosing intellectual property. And um, I'm actually here with a cafeteria. And that's something that you know, people think that, oh, we'll never go out. We're friends or whatever. Or it's, um, I'm disclosing to a bunch of scholars and peers, but it can't go out. And then people really lose their ability to make money. So, um, and lose international rights. Oh, you're welcome. I'll bring it up as many times <laughs> as anybody will let me because it's one of those, I feel a little damaged in a way as like a WordPress user because I've had to, I've had to go through that with people and it's more than just patents. There, there are lots of ways in which you have something that you want to publish but you can't publish it now or it can't be available in certain kinds of ways but you still want to hold on to it. Um, and, and 
in a way, I feel envious of people that haven't tried to wrap their brain around that problem because once you do, you, you kind of look at storage systems completely different from that point on. Yes? Does that support add in here, friends don't let friends buy? Friends don't let friends build data centers. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 a good point and it's a good question. I would say that um, a keyword is a finding aid, um, but just having a keyword in comparison to what a librarian would consider a real finding aid is kind of like a bicycle versus a Ferrari. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of still grappling with that too because that finding aid concept is still kind of tied to physical collections. It's, it's ways that library has, and, and libraries store more than just books. You know, they have, you know, collections of, of um, uh, butterflies and archaeological artifacts. And um, so I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> out what the heck is a finding aid. But it's something that, my, my kind of quick and dirty definition is a finding aid is anything that doesn't make a librarian cringe when you explain how they're gonna find stuff in your system. Which probably isn't the, the most complete answer, but um, I'm still working on wrapping my head around exactly what finding aids are and how we can, how we can help build them into systems. So uh, some of the people that I talk to that, that care about that specifically um, are uh, academic researchers. Um, and academic researchers think an awful lot of their ideas. Sometimes they're right, sometimes maybe they're not right, but that's kind of for history to decide. So that's why they want somebody uh, to be able to see 100 years from now, because the hope is if you're doing real novel research, um, then you're going to be discovering new things um, and society is going to develop in a certain sort of way uh, based on your inventions. Your inventions may be powerful enough to influence how society develops. And if people don't understand what was going on at the time, um, you know, uh, then it can, you can lose out on some of the ideas. Some research ideas aren't fully fulfilled until 100 years later. Uh, the, um, Einstein's theory of relativity wasn't actually definitively pr proven until, uh, um, I may not have been a full hundred years, but it was several years afterwards. But uh, actually to get to, to your point about why would you want your site to be around for a hundred years, which might actually be more of an interesting question. Um, yeah, derivative stuff, okay, I downloaded this from somewhere else and I put it on a site. Maybe those aren't so interesting because um, they're coming from something else, but if you're remixing them in a novel way, that's something that cultural historians actually care about a lot. It's why, uh, for example, the New York Times has every single paper they ever published, they photographed it and put it on this thing called microfiche, which is just a very small um, film negative. Uh, and the New York Times will never ever throw out any article that they actually published, whether it was interesting or not. The thing about um, cultural history is you can't tell what's interesting necessarily, what's going to be interesting um, to historians in the future because you don't know what the future is going to be like. Is Taylor Swift still popular? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it having a full set of what was going on at the time 
is very revealing to, to historians about understanding a certain time period. So your websites that you just did for fun, maybe in a few years you don't care about them, but if somebody is, is studying kind of the culture that was happening when you made them, the fact that you made them actually might be relevant and, and interesting to some future scholar. working with digital asset management systems for a long time, so I'm kind of particular about how I organize my digital assets because I don't want to lose them, I don't want to have to redo them. And the WordPress media library is pretty bad. Um, I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah, I mean, it's almost, almost, almost useless in terms of a, of a database. <clears throat> so there is a plugin that I use called WP Media Library, which lets mm -hmm. you organize the images uh, in groups or by topic or by subject. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helped me out quite a bit. Uh, but a good digital asset management system that's open source is called Resource Space. Yes. And it's something that would probably cost you $50,000 if you had to buy it. But again, it is complex. It's not easy to set up. And uh, you have to have a need for it. Yeah, no, I actually, this is a true story. I had somebody say, hey, I want to hire you to build on the resource space API. And I'm going to build a website and it's going to hook up to the resource spaces API. So I went and dug through the documentation where it said resource space API. It turns out that document isn't a document of the resource space API. It's a document, hey, if you were going to build an API, this is what, how you would do it. So I had to say to that client, yes, I'm not bidding on your job. So, I mean, resource spaces, I think, is a good example of something that, yeah, it exists now, but it would probably take you at least $50,000 to get it set up, not because the software itself is expensive, but just teaching everybody what the heck it does and why the heck it works in the way that it, that it does is a significant undertaking. So, um, but it, I believe it's also, you know, it's written in PHP, um, but it's, looking through the resource spaces uh, um, source code, if, if I were, if somebody said you have to turn WordPress into a dam tomorrow, I don't think I would pick up resource spaces and be like, oh, I'm going to turn this into, into a plugin. I use it right out of the box. There's no, really no customization other, other than the front end, you know, dealing with the theme. Uh, there's not too much to do to get it up and running. You know, it's open source, PHP. Sure. Sure, but it, it's, if say Bindu here were like, okay, I'm going to now store everything that I need to write my books um, in WordPress and I'm going to use resource spaces to do it, well, that wouldn't really work, right? You have to choose one or the other. So it's, I think if, if more people were able to do what you do with resource spaces, but do it with something that they already know, then we'd, we'd have a lot more um, good archives out there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, uh, I understand what you're, you're saying. Uh, you know, the, the, these things have been around for 20 years or so. Right. You know, if you have a need for it, you kind of got to use the right tool. Right, you know, right. That's, right. That's but they, they've been around for 20 years, and I think Resource Space is a, is a good example because of its heritage. It hasn't changed that much since when it was designed, right? Which was several years ago. No, 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 the, uh, I've, I've had a, a site up for a few years now and uh, getting ready to upgrade it. It's not, not fancy. It's not, you know, it's just a database, really. Right. Yeah. yeah, it is just a database. But then again, so is WordPress. Yes. WordPress, if, it's, if, if something's in your media library, it's actually a post. Attachments, they call them attachments, they call them posts, but in the database, it's, it's, it's just a row in the, in the posts table, um, which is similar, I, I think, to probably how the database structure of resource spaces works. So I, I think, in, for, for me, for my approach, I think rather than trying to convince everybody, hey, you should go use research, resource spaces, I don't think that's a battle that I would, I would win because I wouldn't feel good about telling people who aren't already into that kind of stuff, hey, you should go learn this whole other thing that mostly doesn't apply to you just so you can have a good archive. 
I think that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of these these projects they do get funded in a piecemeal fashion because there's not a lot of energy around. Hey, what does a really good archive look like, and how do we get something that librarians and normal people can both use at the same time? That's a uh, I'm interested in that specific. Yeah, that's Well, I guess that was the last question. So, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>